In this presentation, I'd like to talk about uh, <clears throat> some issues that must be addressed for the continued improvement of, of TFETs, and that has to do with dielectric interface traps. So th this work was done in the LEAST Center, directed by Alan Sibar, and one of the primary uh, workers was Jay Min, who's now Dr. Jay Min, and he works at, at Global Foundries. Um, the structures that I'd like to describe have to do with heterojunction uh, tunnel fats based on gallium antimonide, indium arsenide uh, type systems, which offer controllable band gap at the, uh, at the heterojunction and uh, are very promising for future production. And these can be used in either the planar double gate structures shown here or in a nanowire type structure. Now it is uh, now well recognized there are a variety of defects that uh, have frustrated some of the experimental results to date. And, and these include uh, traps within the bulk of the semiconductor, uh, issues having to do with uh, gate oxide, uh, uh, gate metal uh, variations, and then uh, traps at the interface between the oxide and the semiconductor channel. Uh, these are particularly important in the case of 3-5 type structures because there isn't a long history of, of uh, MOS devices, for example, in 3-5 semiconductors. And also, in the very scaled devices that uh, we're all dealing with, just a single defect can have a significant effect on the overall characteristics. So th the goals of this work are, are to try to understand the effect of these uh, structures on <clears throat> Subthreshold slow de degradation and VT variability and low frequency noise, uh, as well as issues of how to minimize uh, the effects, how to measure them, time and temperature dependence, and, and also how bad are these effects uh, in TFETs relative to MOSFETs. So, the first structure that I'd like to describe has to do with the, the planar uh, type embodiment. And the first step is to understand the potential variation between source and drain along the channel. And the frame of reference for our potential calculations has to do with COMSOL electrostatic simulations. And the results, uh, not surprisingly, agree very well with uh, what has been put forward now, a simple analytical relation uh, described by Yuan Tower for, among other things, uh, the subthreshold behavior of, of MOSFETs. Now, to go ahead with the uh, current calculation, one can use relatively simple modeling using WKB approximation to determine uh, the passage of electrons through uh, tunnel barriers of this sort. And <clears throat> that also uh, is relatively straightforward to do uh, with either MATLAB or quasi-analytical formulations. Now, the next thing in the presence of defects is to understand the perturbation to the potential experienced by the uh, tunneling electrons associated with a, a defect at the interface between oxide and channel. And uh, in this case, we show calculations based on COMSOL for a, a particular uh, uh, <clears throat> planar uh, double gate type structure that's been widely studied within Allen Center that has channel thickness of five nanometers and uh, effective oxide thickness of 1.2 nanometers. And the overall, uh, electrostatic potential variation is, is actually quite dismaying. It's, it's very large. It's more than 30 millivolts uh, within the center of the channel uh, underneath the presence of the, uh, of the charge, of a single electron charge uh, sitting in a trap. Um, it's interesting to note that for uh, computations of any elaborate extent, uh, instead of COMSOL simulations, we can replace this by uh, some approximate Green's functions uh, with simple exponentials that work quite well to represent it. And, and to uh, understand how the potential changes as the uh, trap becomes closer to the uh, source channel interface, one can use uh, image charge type formulations. <clears throat> 
So <clears throat> the combined uh, potential involving the ideal device and that uh, perturbation introduced by a single electron charge is, is shown here, both for a positive and negative charge. And correspondingly, there's a change in the current that's expected for the device. And, and what is shown here, by the way, is for a, a narrow strip such that it, there's a single mode propagation, both vertical and, and horizontal, within the, the, the uh, uh, d planar device. Uh, and the width would be about 10 nanometers for this instance. Um, for a repulsive uh, negative charge, uh, there's a decrease in the overall current observed because, the, uh, of course, the tunneling po uh, potential is greater. And it corresponds to a, a, a perhaps a, a shift in VGS needed by about 25 millivolts. For the case of a, an attractive charge, a, a positive charge, uh, actually, there, there's some uh, there's an increase in the overall current that's observed. And there's some differences in the case of very low currents. If this positive charge creates a potential well, then there are different answers depending on whether the charge that's uh, located here must tunnel out uh, towards the drain or it can be excited via phonons. And uh, both answers are, are shown here. But in the case of... Uh, a more realistic scenario with a, a device of realistic length, uh, 100 nanometers, uh, we've done calculations uh, illustrated here, which has uh, an ideal barrier, a combination of defect potentials associated with randomly uh, appearing defects and a total potential of this general sort. And th the results of the calculations are illustrated here. If there's one trap within this uh, device of a, a tenth of a micron width, there's relatively little effect, a, a slight increase in, in leakage current. Um, by the time A traps are included, there's a much more pronounced uh, amount of leakage, perhaps from traps that are located closer to the critical area uh, for tunneling between the source and, and a channel. In the event of 40 traps present, then now there are considerable uh, deviations from the ideal device, and uh, the subthreshold current uh, is worsened, as well as uh, a variation in the threshold voltage or gate voltage that shows up. These correspond to densities of the charges within the materials. For, uh, in this case, uh, in the mid 10 to the 11th charges per square centimeter, where th this is not quite the same thing as DIT, uh, but the uh, effect disappears if we're in the range of 10 to the 10th charges per square centimeter. Uh, after many runs, one can see, get some statistics associated with the variation in current uh, for the different scenarios as indicated here. Uh, for uh, a case where there's a relatively high gate to source voltage and drain to source voltage, when the device is essentially on, there's a little important uh, effect on the current. Uh, little change from the ideal device in terms of the average current and a spread of about 10%. On the other hand, for the off current, uh, in the case of 40 traps, there's an increase in the off current by actually two orders of magnitude. And, and there's a, a range of off current uh, by about a factor of five. So it, it's a really very significant effect. If we look at the uh, <clears throat> variation of the VGS value to attain a given current level. Um, in the presence of one defect, it's, it's perhaps only about a millivolt, and it uh, increases to 15 millivolts for the case of 40 millivolts, uh, 40 defects. And, and there's a, a variation of the standard deviation that roughly follows the square root of the number of defects uh, as expected. Now, it's interesting that uh, the impact on the IV curves uh, 
it is not necessarily associated with the specifics of the uh, particular defect and, and the potential shape that it imposes. Uh, it's a characteristic of the very highly nonlinear uh, behavior of the IV curves for a tunneling FET. Uh, as an example of this, uh, we've put together a very simple model in which a, a device of a reasonable width is, uh, made, is separated into a bunch of uh, st strips. And we assume that the IV, uh, the current that flows in each strip is, is independent of one another. And there's a Gaussian, th there's a distribution of threshold voltage for the different devices that has a Gaussian distribution. Um, for uh, representative uh, IV curves for TFETs, we would get the results shown here for a case of a standard uh, 10 millivolt, uh, standard deviation in threshold voltage. Um, the average current for a structure like this uh, begins to depart from the ideal uh, behavior uh, showing a significant increase in slope. And, and this, once again, is related to the uh, very nonlinear IV curves. Uh, we're all familiar with the fact that when you average quantities exhibited on a, on a log scale, the, the overall average is dominated by the uh, values at the high end of the curve. And, and for the TFET, this is a much more important effect down at the low currents than at the high currents. And, and this is what gives rise to the uh, variation in subthreshold slope. Uh, it would not occur in the case of the, the MOSFET, where for the, uh, an identical type of standard deviation, you would end up with uh, no change in subthreshold slope. And as a result of this, then, uh, for the TFET, the, the subthreshold slope uh, varies with the uh, current through the device in a manner that can be calculated in a very straightforward way for different amounts of uh, standard deviation of the threshold voltage. And uh, in the case of, for example, 30 millivolts of standard deviation, the I60 curve, I I60 current uh, is dropped by a factor of two uh, from this effect alone. And, and, and thus the, the charges associated with these interface states can mask easily mask the ideal behavior of the device. These types of considerations can um, also be used in the case of the uh, nanowire FETs. Uh, most of us are quite familiar with the wonderful results, the, the, the very exciting results that were presented by the Lund University at the last IEDM reaching 43 millivolts per decade. Um, if one goes through the uh, electrostatics for such a nanowire device, we get, once again, very good agreement with the analytical model and, and the potential for tunneling is uh, very similar to an exponential. It's also uh, possible to go through the current uh, analysis with tunneling. And uh, for the device structure, as reported uh, at IDM, uh, by uh, Lars Eric and, and company, uh, one gets actually uh, quite good agreement uh, with only one adjustable parameter, and that has to do with a VT shift. So how about the case of the, uh, the effect of defects? Here, uh, again, it's possible to do um, electrostatic uh, simulations, uh, assuming uh, depleted uh, channel. And here, the, the important thing to note is that the variations in potential at the center of the channel are only six millivolts for this geometry. It's a five times less than we saw for the preceding double gate structure. Uh, so we believe that uh, there's an important effect for the cylindrical geometry uh, to reduce the, the uh, amount of impact of those charges. Uh, <clears throat> while maintaining electrostatic control, even though the dimensions are, are somewhat larger. Uh, 
these potentials associated with the uh, defect structures can also be uh, reproduced uh, with Green's functions that can be written down exactly in terms of Bessel functions or uh, more approximately in terms of exponentials that agree quite well. So uh, the presence of the defect modifies the uh, IV curves in a, in a way shown here for positive and, and negative charges. And uh, certainly it's a lot smaller effect than we saw in the case of the double gate structure, but it's still no noticeable. So at a particular current level, uh, the presence of a defect can change the current by a factor of, well, 1.4 to uh, a factor of two uh, at, at various places around the curve. Now, interestingly, uh, Professor Wernerson and, and uh, colleagues uh, uh, <clears throat> measured, uh, among other things, some kinks in IV curves that correlate with the presence of uh, random telegraph noise. So this difference in, in current between top and bottom here would correspond to the impact of one single charge changing, of, of, uh, equal to the charge of the electron. And in this case, it corresponds with a, a factor of about 1.3, which is, is in uh, rough agreement with, with the calculations that we have shown. Um, and it, it's also quite large for the, uh, the random telegraph noise type currents that are ordinarily experienced. Okay, an, another quick note has to do with the, the fact that there are differences between the effects to be expected in MOSFETs and the expected effects in, in uh, tunnel FETs. Uh, uh, certainly the potentials that are showing up in the channel due to the defects are quite similar, uh, but the current flow mechanisms are different. Um, for the MOSFET, uh, defects, uh, negative defects are particularly important because they raise the uh, potential that must be surmounted by thermionic emission. And, and also defects anywhere within the channel pretty much are important, whereas within the TFET, the defects that are very close to the tunnel junction are the ones that make a difference. So this actually uh, allows us to make some inferences about the low noise, low frequency noise uh, impact in, in these different devices. So for example, for one, one over F noise, uh, conventional theory is that uh, the noise results from uh, traps that exist within the oxide and there's a distribution of associated uh, time constants for that. And, and there's a, a spectral, noise spectral density associated with the charge that depends on the density of oxide traps and the, the tunneling within the oxide. Um, and then that can be related to the overall current noise spectral density by multiplying by di dq squared, where this di dq is the change in current that's induced by a specific charge. This, of course, is what we've been calculating uh, from uh, the, the electrostatic formalism. And, and this has differences between the, uh, the case of the TFET and the MOSFET. So once again, um, Professor Wernerson has uh, measured a variety of these systems and uh, published data uh, associated with the TFET and the MOSFET. And, and actually, the computations uh, associated with DIDT give a, a pretty good fit uh, with the same adjustable parameter for these two styles of devices. So let me end here with a quick summary. Uh, there's a simple formalism to compute the effects of the defects with fixed charge along the channel, showing the variability in threshold voltage and increase in subthreshold slope. This subthreshold slope increase is unavoidable if VTH rand varies randomly uh, for any uh, type of mechanism. The cylindrical geometry appears to be more forgiving than the planar geometry. Uh, it's beneficial to have the smallest uh, effective oxide thickness uh, to reduce this effect. And beyond that, the interface state densities should be reduced to on the order of 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 11th to avoid these effects in different structures. So 
Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot for a fascinating talk. Yeah. I think we have time for a few questions. What, what about the energy position of the interface traps? Does that play a role? Uh, that, the energy position of the traps will influence time constants associated with them. But what we're discussing here has to do uh, entirely with the uh, charge associated with the trap, which we're taking to be plus Q, zero, or minus Q. Well, the traps uh, will be filled sometimes and empty sometimes. And right, and, and the rate at which this happens influences the, the noise. And, and to get, uh, so if you had a single trap, then you would see a, a Lorentzian type uh, frequency dependence uh, at low frequencies. And, and the 1 over f results if you have a, a distribution of, of these time constants. So it, with a bulk oxide traps, uh, the time constants vary because of tunneling uh, times. If you have uh, so-called DIT, uh, interface traps, right at that uh, plane of interface, then you have time constants because of uh, resulting from the energy distribution. Um, you've done a great job uh, calculating the electrostatic effects of traps, but in addition, uh, uh, traps can assist tunneling, so we have trap-assisted tunneling, and uh, we're already seeing the effects of individual defects. So uh, do we have to just face up to the reality that uh, uh, the situation is actually rather dire? Uh, because of the fact that uh, we, we've got to reduce uh, the defect density uh, much lower than, than uh, uh, previously uh, anticipated. I think the, the estimate you made of 10 to the 10, 10 to 11 is reasonable for uh, electrostatic effects, but if you add in all the other bad effects of defects, uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it, it's pushing us in the direction of uh, a, a much higher degree of perfection. Well, uh I would certainly agree that there are other possible effects of those interface traps associated with trap-assisted tunneling. Um, and uh, I don't have, it, that has not been part of uh, this particular work, but I would argue that for a representative trap at the interface, the effects are smaller than this. I think traps at the bulk, uh, within the bulk, at the interface between source and channel, uh, the trap-assisted tunneling can be quite strong. But um, actually, I have charts to show you <laughs> individuals. I anticipated this question, but, but I don't have the, the, the charts right here to show. But I, I believe that uh, with a cross-section for capture of electrons of traps of order 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 15, uh, per square centimeter, uh, I'm sorry, centimeter squared. Uh, and if you have a trap density of 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12 uh, per square centimeter, then you really don't have to worry about that effect for the interface traps. Uh, thank you for the talk. I, I, I agree with your last statement. Uh, you, one can make a back of the envelope and you'll see that trapezoid tunneling is actually lower than this electrostatic effect. So uh, you write the electrostatic effect is probably worse. One thing just stuck with me though is uh, how, how different was your double gate five nanometer result versus 10 nanometer, not five nanometer, but 10 nanometer diameter, which not necessarily have better electrostatic. They will have about similar electrostatics. Um, there was well, a significant actually, improvement. I, I, actually, it's 10 nanometers radius for the uh, nanowire that I was reporting on, which is what Lars Eric published, I believe, in, in December. But I think tomorrow, Professor Wernerson will tell us more about smaller nanowires. And, and I know that you I was referring to your defect, defect analysis, which you showed the millivolts, the effect of the electrostatic effect improved significantly. Yes. For although you moved from five nanometer double gate to 10 nanometer. So the improvement was very significant relative to what well, you would expect. Actually, so uh, I think uh, 
there's an overall, uh, for the planar structure, it was five nanometers overall thickness. For the nanowire structure that I described, it was a 20 nanometers diameter. So it makes my point even more important that it's a significant improvement going to the circular architecture. I, I believe so. I, I, and why do we choose to make only five nanometer channels from the planar structure? It, it, it's maybe another question. It's to get good electrostatic control in that geometry. And, and you can do better with the cylindrical geometry. I just want to have one small comment. If you continue that circular, I do believe nanowire, with the millivolts you showed, the, the requirement should be significantly smaller than what your double gate showed. I, I and agree. that's what the device needs to go anyway. I agree. That, that's why anyway. you could get into the 10 to the 11th that's range right. and, and be comfortable. I agree, yes. So I think it's time to close this session here and let's thank the speaker and let's thank all the speakers and go for a coffee break.